Hello, I'm Rachel Stoll, Vice President at the Stimson Center. On behalf of the Forum on the Arms Trade and today's co-sponsors, the Arms Control Association, the Center for Civilians in Conflict, Democracy for the Arab World Now, the Security Systems Monitor, the Center for International Policy, and my own organization, the Stimson Center, welcome to this year's conference exploring the critical and timely theme of advancing a more responsible arms trade policy. The forum, which last week celebrated its sixth anniversary, is a professional network of more than 100 experts, roughly a third of whom are based in Washington, D.C., others around the United States, and about half of them are based internationally. These experts are tied together by our shared work on strengthening public efforts to address the humanitarian, economic, and other implications of arms transfers, security assistance, and weapons use. I and many of the Today's panelists are members of the forum, and we're delighted to be joined by leading members of Congress, other civil society experts, and you, the audience participants, for this timely and much needed conversation. Throughout the conference, I encourage you to use Zoom's Q&A function to ask questions, and please use the hashtag ResponsibleArms2021 if you want to tweet about the event. As you know, there are three panels today. I'll say more about the first panel and panelists in a moment, but just to quick, quickly review the agenda. After this first panel, we'll be joined by experts Radia Almulcatel in Yemen and Inigo Arendando Vera in Mexico to discuss with John Sarah Leah Winston the impact of weapons on communities internationally. So please stay for that panel. And then finally, in our final hour, we'll conclude with a conversation on what Congress can do to ensure greater transparency and responsibility in the United States' approach to conventional arms sales. We'll have remarks and insights from representatives Alan Omar and Ted Liu and moderated by civics Dan Mahanti. And that will be sure to be a fascinating uh, conversation. So please stay for that as well. I wanna start with a few words about why we're holding this conference and also frame the first panel to highlight the urgency of our conversation today. As President-elect Joe Biden prepares to take office next week, there is a full and pressing agenda awaiting his administration. Although it may not seem as high a priority as the COVID-19 pandemic or climate change or even the events of the last week in the United States, there is significant urgency and numerous opportunities to make much needed change to strengthen US arms transfer controls. As US weapons continue to be used across the world at times disrupting security and stability and perpetuating harm. While often behind the headlines, the international arms trade is linked to foreign policy and national security. It has an outsized impact on conflict and stability and the lives and livelihoods of people around the world. The Trump administration's approach to US arms sales has led to devastating effects during the last four years. Let me tell you how. The Trump administration reoriented the U.S. approach to arms sales by prioritizing perceived economic gains over foreign policy concerns and national security interests. The administration made selling weapons a pillar, a central pillar of U.S. foreign policy priorities. During the first three years of, the, of Donald Trump's tenure, U.S. foreign military sales agreements totaled more than $200 billion. However, in using arms sales as a political tool for short-sighted and mostly economic objectives, the administration's arms transfers policies often overlooked risks to human rights, civilian protection, stability, and longer-term US strategic interests. While the value of the weapons sold is telling, what is more concerning are the recipients of those weapons, with the United States actively pushing through arms sales to countries with concerning human rights records, such as Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and the Philippines. The Biden administration has an opportunity to reinvigorate U.S. leadership on conventional arms issues and develop an approach that reflects longstanding U.S. values and principles, and that reinforces a respect for human rights, risk mitigation, and restraint. And that's what this first panel is going to do. It is going to share the ways and give much needed advice to the Biden administration on how we can develop a more uh, responsible and accountable U.S. arms transfer policy. 
And I couldn't be more excited to join the three women you see before you today, um, who truly are experts in this field. And this is really an all-star uh, panel looking at these issues. First, we're joined by Brittany Benowitz, who's Chief Counsel at the American Bar Association's ABA Center for Human Rights. We have Sarah Holwinski, the Washington Director at Human Rights Watch, and Rose Jackson, the Director of the Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council. So we're gonna run this, this panel like a conversation, um, and then I'll open it up to audience questions. So we need to um, uh, use the Q&A function if you'd like to reach out, and we will screen those and get them to the panelists um, in due course. So first I wanna ask each of you, you heard my frame, you heard why I think it's important we're doing this conference today. Why should we be having this conversation and why now? Uh, let's, start, let's start with you, Brittany. And you'll take yourself off mute, please. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, and wanna start off by saying in the interest of having a lively conversation, I will be speaking in my individual capacity, not on behalf of the ABA. Um, so why now? You know, right out of the gate, President Biden's going to have to make some important decisions about whether or not pending sales to the Middle East should go through. We're talking about advanced weapon systems that will permanently change the military edge in that region. And so you cannot forego a review of that without having to live with the consequences of that for a generation. Uh, and it's not just the Middle East. It's not just the big high profile drone and F-35 sales. It's also going to be small arms to the Philippines and to India. So, and unfortunately, it is a day one decision for this administration. And I would say that it's important not only with regards to these individual sales, but the reality is that the United States has not, whatever our national security goals are abroad, whether it's stabilizing the Middle East or countering terrorism, arms sales and security cooperation is central to that. But it's never been treated that way. It's never been treated as a strategically significant enterprise. And that needs to change. Uh, since 9-11, we really opened up the spigots and we sold weapons to just about every regime that you can imagine, no matter how bad their human rights record was. And it's hurt us. There's a really strong, significant empirical record showing that abusive by security forces contribute to violent extremism. So if we wanna get a handle on that problem, if we want to stabilize these regions then we need to start thinking about this as a strategically significant enterprise. Uh, so I'll just start with that. Rose, let me ask you the question. Why should we be having this conversation today? Thank you. And let me just say thank you, Rachel, and my fellow panelists and the, the co-hosts of this event for convening a really important conversation. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes, as, as Brittany referenced, the conversation about, you know, arms sales and arm trades and security assistance can become somewhat technocratic. And we miss the fact that U.S. support to foreign military and police in its numerous forms is foreign policy. And for many people around the world, it is the most visible and frankly consequential form of foreign policy in their lives. Uh, people understand American made weapons as an expression of American intent, whether that is true or not, that's reality. Um, I think we have a really interesting opportunity. I'm encouraged by the fact that the incoming Biden administration has signaled its intent to uh, center human rights and democracy and broader universal values as a core part of its foreign policy and the re-entering of the United States and the world post-Trump. Um, but I think it's important to state outright that that will be very difficult to do without taking head on some incoherence in what has been long running uh, policy, both in Democratic and Republican administrations about how our arms sales are used, particularly in places like Saudi Arabia. So on a, on a more positive note, I'd say there is opportunity in the confusion of this moment. Certainly the State Department, a key part of who gets to make these decisions has been put through a lot in the last four years and stripped down to, uh, uh, <laughs> we'll just say not its best capacity. And in the moments that we have right now to talk about how we want our government to function and what we want the United States to look like in the world, we have an opportunity to get this right, I think for the first time in a long time. Uh, so I think now is the perfect time to be having a conversation about how the United States as Brittany said, puts this back into a structure that means arms sales and arms transfers have something to do with our broader national security, foreign policy, and other interests. Sarah, same to you. Why, why are you excited that we're able to have this conversation today? Um, two reasons. I, I think one is that, you know, my job at Human Rights Watch is to influence U.S. policy 
toward human rights, um, promoting and defending human rights. And so um, arms sales, security assistance, that whole bucket of issues is one of the big ways that the US can do that around the world, whether it's a decision to sell to a particular country, a decision not to, um, conditions that, that the Biden administration might wanna put on arms sales to a particular country that have to do with human rights, or the decision to stop or halt arms sales um, after a country has abused human rights, all really important pressure points. Um, and the second is that, I mean, to, to Brittany and Rose's point, who an administration, who America and how America sells weapons to nations defines the character of that administration. And to Rose's point, defines the character of the nation to the rest of the nations around the world and to their people. And so the incoming administration, you know, if it, if it truly indeed wants to prioritize human rights um, as a central tenet of foreign policy, this is one of the big ways that it can show that it is in fact doing that. I wanna stay with you, Sarah, because you have experience in the executive branch and now you're at Human Rights Watch uh, where clearly human rights take center stage. So if you were advising the Biden administration, what would be your top three priorities when it comes to conventional arms trade issues? Yeah, this is a, this is a really tricky issue for people in the executive because human rights, um, while we believe it should always be at the decision-making table and should always be a consideration is not necessarily going to, um, Trump, as it were, economic or other interests, national security interests. And so there's a lot for policymakers to weigh. We, of course, think that human rights should be one of those things. And so um, on that scale of things to weigh, I would say um, intelligence and information on partners. So on allies, partners, whomever we're going to be selling, transferring arms, material, technology to, we want to know who these people are. We want to know their character. We want to know their patterns of behavior. And this is not just about whether they have committed war crimes or there's a mass atrocity going on. This is about, you know, do they quash free speech? Can people freely assemble? Are they going to use these weapons in domestic law enforcement operations um, to crack down on peaceful protests? There's a lot of things that I think U.S. policymakers should and must know about these partners before selling weapons. And I think, you know, I'm, I, how they go about getting this information, how they process it, how they analyze it, that's for them to decide. Perhaps it has to do with the intelligence community, perhaps DRL, INR, all of these. I'm throwing out acronyms now, which is really wonky. I'm sorry. Um, all of these bureaus within the State Department and Department of Defense should probably be involved in that. But that's certainly one thing I think you'll hear echoed throughout this forum. Um, the second thing I'll mention, which is halting uh, arms sales and transfers to nations like Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates with a clear pattern of violating um, human rights and the international laws of war. And then finally, I would let, I mean, this, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the United States should be preparing the paperwork to sign on to or ratify in some cases treaties that have to do with arms and weapons. And so you've got the landmines treaty, you've got the cluster munitions convention, we should be doing more on explosive weapons and making sure that, um, that they are not harming civilian populations. And the United States should also be working toward a ban on fully autonomous um, weapons without a human in the loop. Um, and uh, lots of organizations call those killer robots just so that you have in your mind what we, what we are talking about. And I would, of course, add to your list, Sarah, the uh, reversing the Trump administration's policy towards the arms trade treaty as well. So I think, yes, there are there are numerous uh, numerous international agreements that the U.S. can join on to to demonstrate that commitment and that approach of values that you mentioned. Rose, I'm wondering if you could talk about what that approach could encompass. What might it look like? Yeah, I, I want to move um, a level higher, I think, and focus on the question of policymaking and decision making itself. I think, you know, as we've all referenced, the fact that arms transfers are kept so separate as a conversation from broader policymaking, what tends to happen is we've lost track of why we're doing most of what we're doing. And so when a moment comes, policymaking is a, a constant exchange, a give and take of interests, right? You have to assess, is what I get from doing this worth the harm? There's, there's no version of a policy that's just all good. <laughs> uh, and perhaps if we can find one, then you are now president. Um, 
But in that context, it makes it very difficult to have these conversations about human rights and about what we're getting, because we've for so long just kind of taken as a de facto that we give these weapons to people or we sell these weapons to people in certain countries in particular. And so I think there's a few things. One is the word transactional often gets used in a negative connotation. And I'd like to actually re-embrace the transactional nature of a relationship. I think there are countries in the world that are deserving of real investment and real partnership because we have an alliance of values and an alliance of interests. But I don't think that's every country in the world. And what that means is we can have space to engage meaningfully with countries that have problematic records that aren't exactly where we might want them to be and frankly don't align in their interests for the world more broadly, but perhaps share a security concern or a particular need in that moment. If we manage to reframe our relationship with those countries to say, we're partnering with you right now because we both care about Al-Shabaab in Somalia, or we're both deeply concerned about the deteriorating situation in the Sahel, or we're concerned about in the Saudi example, you're worried about Iran, we're worried about Iran. If we have these actual honest conversations with ourselves and with our partners, it actually opens space for a more honest and frankly coherent policy approach on these questions. I don't think that we can get to a place uh, on arms trade that looks like what any of us are talking about if we don't start truth telling a bit more internally in addition to externally. Uh, and that may seem like a bit of a cop out, but it, it was uh, frankly while serving in the executive branch myself, quite jarring to see how often there was that disconnect between what seemed obvious on the outside and what the day-to-day -day churn required of how we approach these issues. Um, the, the last thing that I would say is focusing on accountability is a really important piece of this. And I think that there's been a lot of progress over the years through a number of different uh, approaches to try and invest in what I like to call accountability ecosystems in the countries that we do end up engaging with particularly those that have concerns with security sector abuses, human rights abuses, and broader democratic backsliding. And in those places, ensuring that any time that we do decide cogently and coherently that our interest in providing weapons for a security context uh, wins the day, that we simultaneously pair that with investments in civil society in that country, journalists in that country, academics in that country, and other people that are able to keep a tab on what is happening, uh, as well as ensure that the infrastructure of civilian rights and support and engagement uh, is as robustly supported by the United States as what the rest of the world will understand to be a robust support for military and use of force. There's a lot to do, just even in those short answers, it demonstrates the sort of breadth um, of activity that really will be necessary to right the ship, so to speak, in terms of the U.S. approach to arms transfers, how they are used, to whom um, they are sold, et cetera. So let me ask you, Brittany, what would you like to see the administration focus on on day one, within the first 100 days, or even the first year of the administration, as some of these things are sort of, you know, executive order type things, and others are really systematic and systemic changes um, that Rose, for example, just described? Like I said, day one, there are pending sales or recently approved sales that need urgently to be reviewed. It's important to remember that we are not talking about a regular transition, right? We are talking about sales that were approved after significant irregularities reported by the State Department IG and that have been the subject of historic resolutions of disapproval in the US Congress, bipartisan resolutions of disapproval that were vetoed by the president. In that context, it's important to do an across the board review. It's not just one or two high profile sales in the Middle East. It's you know, sales of small arms in Latin America that are ending up in the hands of cartels, right? It all needs to be reviewed. Uh, and there needs to be, that needs to be day one because they have to suspend, otherwise those weapons will be delivered. Day 100, there needs to be a review of the conventional arms transfer policy, which was amended to say that we can provide weapons to foreign governments. They're gonna use them in war crimes as long as they're not intentional. Well, guess what? That's not consistent with US law. Uh, and so it needs to be revised. And with that revision of that policy, there needs to be a top to bottom review of compliance with existing law. We at the ABA did a study looking around the world at uh, arms trade policies. And what we found is that the, AB, the United States has great laws on the books that are not enforced, right? We have a law that says you can't provide security assistance to a government engaged in a consistent pattern of human rights abuses. We have another law that says if a government misuses our equipment, then they don't get more of it. Those are two common sense 
rules. There is an exception, but it requires high level approval. I would say that's quite rational. These were enacted post Watergate to deal with an unruly president. Uh, and you know what? Now's the time to revisit those laws and enforce them. And that would bring us a long way towards having a rational arms trade policy. Uh, and that means doing things like investigating violations of end use agreements. You know, if the UAE sent uh, drone technology or other arms into Libya in violations of a UN embargo, that should have consequences. Uh, and likewise for civilian casualties in Yemen. Uh, within the first year, I think it's gonna be necessary to look at the decision to effectively deregulate semi-automatic assault rifles and other small arms and ammunition. These are the real weapons of mass destruction that claim thousands of lives every year. Uh, and we have far too many uh, terrorists and criminal organizations are getting our hands on those weapons. So the decision to uh, re relax controls on those should be revisited within the first year. Thanks, Brittany. Before we turn to Sarah and Rose to, um, to answer that question, um, I'd love to pull up our first audience poll, which will look at what countries um, you mentioned at the outset, uh, Brittany, uh, that you know, in the first day we need to stop arms sales that have been particularly controversial, not just to the Middle East. And so I'm wondering if we can pull our audience um, to see where they think that arms sales should be paused on day one. So if we could pull that poll up. Here we go. Fortunately, panelists can't vote. Um, but I'd love the audience to pick up to three uh, places where they'd like to see arm sales halted on day one. And Sarah, this is giving you time to think about your day one, day 100, uh, and first year, your first year answer. Oh, it says it only allows you to select one. Do the best you can. It's my first time using a um, using a poll. So the magic of polling will finalize this, and we'll get our answers here in a second. Okay, I'm not sure how it, you can't, can people hear me? Okay, I wasn't speaking, I was waiting. I'm not sure how it magically ends and how it be, how we get the results. But perhaps as we're waiting for that, Sarah, I'll turn to you to sort of talk about um, what you, oh, and here's the results. So it looks like overwhelmingly Saudi Arabia um, had the highest level. And of course that's been the most controversial and most um, public in the resolutions of disapproval from the U.S. the bipartisan, as, as uh, Brittany mentioned, the bipartisan resolutions of disapproval. Um, but clearly there's other countries of interest and concern and of course didn't include many countries that um, should also be considered. And I think that's where Brittany's top to bottom review of arms sales policy um, weighs in. So Sarah, let me turn to you in terms of what you see as the day one um, day 100 and first year? Sure. Um, so day one, I mean, day one is so easy if we say just, you know, halt these weapons to Saudi Arabia or UAE. But I want to I want to take it in a slightly different direction, which is to say that I've been very worried over the past four years, 20 years, maybe that the American people don't actually understand very much about what is happening in foreign policy. And that's not their fault. Um, it is, I believe, because the administrations are not actually talking to the American people about foreign policy, values, principles, why we do what we do, we being the United States, not me. Um, and so I want to make sure that uh, if President Biden comes in and believes that we should have a different policy and how we are engaging in the world that he talks to the American people about what that policy is. I want to make sure that the Secretary of State, if he believes that we need a different way of engaging on arms sales and security assistance with partners and allies, that he actually explains to the American people what that means, where their money is going, 
uh, in security assistance, where their weapons that are made in Ohio and everywhere else, um, where they are going, what they are doing, what our intent is, how we're going to monitor them. And then um, for the first hundred days, I mean, I think I think it is, Rose, you should tell me because you, you, you'll tell me if it's possible to do within a hundred days or not. But I feel like within a hundred days, there could be a new framework for including human rights considerations within every single arms sale and security assistance deal that is going forward. And that would be within the conventional arms trade um, transfer policy and several other mechanisms. But um, you know, ensuring that if, if you consider arms sales as like an Excel spreadsheet, that there is a column for human rights considerations. Can you check that box? Yes, we have considered the human rights implications and ramifications of making this deal. So I, I want to remind um, our participants that they can use the Q&A function to ask their own questions. But I do want to ask you, Rose, not just what Sarah just asked you, but I do want to ask you, um, you know, I think we it's very easy for us to sit on a very comfortable panel in our homes and have a conversation about what the Biden administration can do. But I think all of us have been around in this town long enough to know that action on these issues is really hard. It's much easier to loosen restrictions on arm sales than to impose restraint on arm sales, partly because of what you all said, that they're very misunderstood as how they can be used as a tool of foreign policy. Many see it as a slippery slope for banning all arm sales if you talk about um, having certain criteria or if you, God forbid, talk about human rights and democracy as a criteria for arm sales, who um, does that uh, not allow you to sell arms to in terms of larger national security objectives. So I'm wondering if, Rose, you can mention, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges that the Biden administration will face, even if they embraced the approach that we've all talked about here today? What's the reality of, of why this is so hard and why it will be hard for them? I mean, not to sound too wonky, but there's so many equities at play here. And whether that's in Congress, where we do have, I'd say, historic change in the way that uh, both Republican and Democratic members seem to be approaching these questions. I, when, you know, when I served, certainly uh, there, there wasn't a version of the world where you could imagine a bipartisan statement of rebuke to a president for sending arms to Saudi Arabia. That just was an inconceivable concept. And I think it's important to acknowledge that um, the window has moved on that, and that's real. Um, at the same time, you know, we do still deal with the fact that these weapons are made in towns across America where there are members of Congress who have to remain concerned about the jobs of their constituents, and that will always be um, an element at play. Uh, we have additionally, you know, the complex conversations about R&D and how long those cycles take to develop weapons, uh, whether that's for ourselves or for the, the broader ecosystem. You have longstanding partners that are accustomed to engaging with the United States in a certain way. And I can say certainly that if, if the administration were to take the approach of trying to reset the expectations of how the United States engages in the world, that would certainly be met with quite a bit of outcry from partners. And there would be a lot of diplomatic work that would have to go into normalizing and resetting the bar, which I would argue is worth it, but that's not an easy thing. Uh, and then there's the real difficult policy trade-offs. When we are faced with, I, I think a lot of people like to say it's a question of our hard security interests and our human rights interests. And I think that's actually a, a false dichotomy. More often, it's a, a trade-off between short and long-term interests. And the policymaking apparatus is much better at short-term interests than it is at long-term interests. But those aren't easy decisions when we're talking about a real security threat in a region faced, facing us versus the long-term degradation of American credibility or broader American interests. Um, and so I, again, I, I, I'm gonna be the person at the uh, 3000 foot level, but um, this stuff takes a long time. The, the final thing I would say is just to remember that arms sales itself sit within this much larger ecosystem of security sector assistance, which includes financing other countries, providing them weapons for free, as well as the support and training uh, and other forms of assistance that we provide military and police around the world for a bunch of different reasons, some very good and some somewhat questionable. But in that context, it's important to note, and we haven't discussed this yet, that particularly since 9-11, 
and the infrastructure that supports that decision making process and supports the implementation of these policies became quite skewed where the state department in the lead uh, in in the lead as the foreign policy part of the us government uh, started off with something like 80% purview over the money that was spent in the countries it would go to and after 9/11 um, as the war on terror ramped up and our engagement overseas uh, became quite as widespread as it is, uh, we, we've basically flipped that, where the Defense Department oversees 80% plus <laughs> of the assistance that we provide to other countries, which the vast majority of that, frankly, in the State Department's control is still large FMF grants uh, to Egypt and Israel. And so in that context, um, the hardest thing is going to be rebuilding and building a new an infrastructure of government capable of overseeing a policy that we want to exist. Uh, and that can't be overstated. And Brittany, I wanna follow up on something that Rose said that some of these are sort of systemic issues, right? That they're just really hard to, to address in, in the context of all the other competing interests. And I want I wanna talk about this pushback of, um, cutting off arms sales to human rights abusers or less democratic regimes, because as you know from your time in Congress, but also just reading the newspaper, there's always this argument that if the United States doesn't sell arms to some of these countries, then um, some of our um, Russia or China will sell to them. And particularly with this larger theme of great power competition that we're, and I thought I would get away with a panel without using great power competition, but alas. Uh, but in that context and in sort of the frame that we've seen in the last, particularly the last four years, how do we overcome that if we don't sell, someone else will, and this is gonna be really challenging um, for our, our place in the world? I really think this is overstated. Uh, we did an analysis of arms sales to the Middle East. We found that 75% of all arms sales to the Middle East are NATO, right? So we're, the United States is not competing with Russia and China in the Middle East. We're competing with the UK and France, right? So the issue there, we have a control of that market. Saudi Arabia spent over $100 billion in building an Army, Navy, and Air Force on NATO equipment. They cannot turn around tomorrow and buy Russian equipment that's second grade and not interoperable. So it really is overstated. They'll play that game. You know, King Solomon went and visited Russia. And there are countries like India that intentionally buy from a lot of different suppliers to, to maintain their independence. But the reality is that it, there, you can't just turn around and on a dime and do this. Um, I think the other thing that we need to understand is that if we cannot get our partners to not use our weapons to commit war crimes, then we are going it actually makes us less safe if we continue to provide those weapons. And so we need to be prepared to walk away. Uh, and I think that what we have found uh, is that the United States, sorry there, you get, I'm back, apologies for that. Um, if we sell our weapons to people engaged in war crimes, it makes us less safe and we need to be prepared to walk away. Uh, and I think that we, it's very easy to fall into this false binary that you either provide everything or you don't provide anything. I don't think anyone here is calling for a complete suspension in arms sales to any partner. The idea is that you should use those sales and that security partnership and that training to leverage behavior that you need from that partner. And there was a study commissioned by DOD that looked at 10 of the key partnerships the United States has had over the last 10 years. And across the board, we've been the United States fails to leverage its assistance in a manner that gets the behavior that we need, which leads to long-term stability so that we don't have to continue to send our own troops in to uh, stop you know, terrorist attacks and continue to provide this assistance, much of which is provided on a grant basis, right? And I think the American people would like to see us transition towards dealing with our own economic problems in the pandemic rather than providing grant assistance for 20 plus years to the same regime that's abusing its own people. I wanna pick up on the point you just made, Brittany, about sort of the economic aspects of this. And we have a couple questions um, in both the chat and the q and It'd be helpful, use the Q&A, please. It's easier for me to, for me to track. Um, but in the Q&A about sort of the military industrial complex, the role of the defense industry, the sort of long-term oft debunked argument that um, arms sales equals jobs or exports subsidize um, domestic production, which is true. Um, and, but it's really that they ex, they subsidize and that it is profits for the defense 
um, companies. And so the question is, how do we rethink um, sort of the, the administrations or the executive branch's relationship with industry, the procurement process, um, arm sales, restraining military exports without damaging our U.S. and de defense industrial base. How are all of these things linked? Because those, again, are arguments that you hear from members of Congress that have companies in their, um, in their districts. Are there things that we can do to debunk some of these economic interests and demonstrate that it's not a zero-sum game in, in, in that sense? Well, I think Bill DeHartung and others have done an excellent job of debunking that. And the, the mil U.S. defense industrial base does not depend upon foreign military sales for its well-being. It will survive uh, if we exercise more restraint and we're more cautious about how we do this. You know, I'm not. We're talking about the idea that if you sell a weapon platform to a foreign government and they misuse it, putting a pause on deliveries of munitions. All right. We're not going to lose a factory in the United States because we do that. But we could very well you lose the lives of American service members who are targeted by terrorists because they're very angry about civilian casualties in their country. There are a couple of questions in the chat about uh, transparency and how in the last four years in particular, um, in all, many issues, it's become increasingly more difficult to get information or at least timely information on arms sales, on recipients, on licenses, on negotiations, et cetera. And so I'm wondering if, if any of you uh, would like to sort of take on this issue of what would we like to see from a Biden administration in terms of increasing transparency uh, with regards to, to arms sales, which could also lead to accountability and oversight by, by Congress. I mean, I, I think all of us in our, our prep had noted how important it is to reset the relationship with Congress. Um, it, it almost seems like too easy of a point to make considering that the Trump administration frankly stopped <laughs> applying statutory responsibility. Um, so number one, just going back to actually doing what Congress requires the executive branch to do would be a helpful start. But I think in general, more transparency is better. And then particularly when it comes to the use of force, um, you know, when I talked about the importance of accountability ecosystems in countries that we end up providing weapons to, the accountability ecosystem in our own country is just as if not more important to ensure has the tools and transparency it needs to operate. Um, I, one of the things that always shocked me when I started digging into these questions was that the government itself has a hard time knowing the exact amount of support that it is providing any country at a given time. So many different sources and kinds of assistance. And to me, that's insane. As a regular citizen, it is crazy to think that the president of the United States could ask uh, his or her most senior leaders, how much are we spending in Nigeria? And the answer would come back, we can't quite tell you that. But that's true. That's the reality. Um, and so any and all efforts to increase internal and external transparency, reporting to Congress, the real hard and extremely boring work of changing how we track and report on things will have serious ramifications for the ability to hold ourselves accountable to human rights standards. I wanna pick up on this point you made, um, Rose, about sort of the really, um, it's not even challenging. It's almost disastrous relationship that the Trump administration has had with Congress. And if you even read today's reporting about the conversation about Yemen yesterday and staffers sort of flying off the handle at, at uh, the administration yet again, not informing Congress or not having a conversation with Congress. We've seen with regards to arms sales, the imposition of emergency powers for arms sales that Congress clearly um, had, did not want to see go forward. And so that relationship is going to take quite some time to repair. We're going to hear later this afternoon um, at this forum from two members of Congress who've been extremely outspoken um, in their opposition to particular arms sales. But I'm wondering if there are specific things that you could, that you would advise and maybe Brittany, I'll start with you, given that you worked on the Hill. Uh, are there certain things that you would advise the Biden administration do sort of on day one and to repair that relationship with Congress, which on particularly on this issue, but which obviously would serve many other issues as well? Well, I think a comprehensive review of pending sales would reset that relationship right away. And, and I think there's two other things that fundamentally need to change in the relationship with Congress. It is crazy if you think about it, that we continue with sales once a country goes, a partner goes into a state of armed conflict, and that's not the subject of an affirmative vote in the Congress, 
I mean, we are providing sales and training and assistance, sometimes side by side, along with foreign military forces. And that does put our own troops at times at imminent risk of being pulled into conflict. That should require an affirmative vote of the Congress, right? And so there is a need to flip the script so that rather than the default is yes to all sales, it's yes to most sales, but if there's a war, let's pause, let's think about this, let's make sure this is really consistent with our policies and our values. Uh, the second thing that's really important is I, to understand how much security assistance is happening below the radar through clandestine and covert authorities. You know, there are whole private armies being run to the tunes of billions of dollars since 9-11 through both DOD and CIA authorities. And the Congress probably has no clue. If you want to ask, if you were to ask them, where are all the countries in which we are doing supporting, you know, foreign militias? I don't think the Congress has that list or very few people in the Congress do. So there, there's a need for oversight and hearings and transparency. And there's a need to rein in all these new authorities that were created post 9-11 that gave the Defense Department exemptions from the other legal framework and also gave a lot of authority to the Commerce Department of all uh, you know, entities to be in charge of exporting weapons. That needs to be reviewed by the Congress. I'm not sure if Sarah or Rose um, have anything to add to that, but I want to ask one last question before we, we move on to our next panel. And I hope it's a good introduction into that next panel, which is that um, I started my remarks today by saying, you know, this is really at the end of the day, this is about human beings, right? It's about whether or not our arms sales are being used to foment conflict, to cause civilian harm, or if they really are being used as intended either for self-defense or um, other sort of foreign policy objectives. And it, this is also an issue that for those of us particularly um, that we, uh, we've been working on for, I don't wanna say decades, but for some of us it's decades, um, you know, really the importance of getting people to care about this right? That this is one of the issues that you see on the front page of the paper every day, even if you don't realize it's an arms trade issue. So one of the questions we had was, how do we get more people engaged um, on this issue? How do you intersect with the things that people are ready for the Biden administration to care about on day one? Things like climate change, healthcare reform, et cetera. Um, so sort of as you're closing, as you're closing words, um, how, do you, how do you see that happening? And maybe we'll start with Sarah. I'll just go backwards this time. Sarah, we'll start with you. It's a really um, difficult question, Rachel. Thanks for thanks for throwing it at me here at the end. Um, I would say, you know, the the president who is currently in office actually did a phenomenal job of talking directly to the American people. Um, I didn't always like what he said, but he did open that channel of communication, and I think that President Biden needs to do the same thing. And so if we are going to intersect all of these issues, if we are going to say that this is a um, really important part of our foreign policy, and if we are going to say that there's going to be a change and we're going to do it in a responsible way, um, then I think that direct channel of communication is really important and we should be talking to the American people about it. Thanks, Rose, to you. I think that we're all having a really important conversation in the foreign policy community right now that I find encouraging, which is, the humbling experience of the last four years and reminding us that the United States is a country like any other country grappling with many of the same issues that we have been collaborating with others in other countries to address in their own homes. Uh, and I think there is a push to more directly link the conversations we have about use of force and, and security assistance and security sector abuses uh, with <laughs> the, the challenges we have at home around policing, around militarization, around the deadliness and the extent of weaponry available on our streets. And I see that as a really positive opportunity to not just tell Americans that they should care about these things, but meet Americans where their conversation currently is and help them understand the connections and implications uh, in the foreign policy world. Uh, I would just say, one other front, I think we sometimes over technocrat, over technocraticize, that's not a word, but I'm going to use it. We overcomplicate this stuff. At the end of the day, what we're talking about, and I think most Americans understand this and think that we're being a little disingenuous when we don't say it this way. If an American made bomb drops on the house of a foreign national, that person doesn't question whether the United States wanted that to happen. They assume the United States wanted that to happen. And that happens in our name 
and it happens with our tax dollars. And I think when we have real conversations about why we're doing what we're doing and how we can prevent those sorts of things from happening, that we're gonna have an easier time in including and energizing the American public and staying involved uh, in foreign policy more broadly. People, people know when you're dodging. Thanks, thanks Rose. Brittany, last word to you. The American people don't want to be bogged down in quagmires overseas. They wanna support foreign powers that are legitimate and can handle their own security without our assistance, without our boots on the ground. And we're not gonna be able to achieve that end so that we can get to focusing on the pandemic and our own economic issues so long as we cannot have a rational policy around security partnerships and arms trade. So I think you can all see why I was so excited to speak with these three really smart women who have um, you know, not only vast expertise but, and knowledge, but a real passion for continuing this discourse to having um, these conversations and to having real policy change. Now you've heard now for the last uh, 50 minutes what the experts think. So I wanna end with our last poll of what you all think the Biden administration should do in its first 100 days as we transition to hearing about um, how these weapons affect people on the ground every day. So you're being asked to pick one um, of the top arms trade reform fixes that the Biden administration could focus on in its first 100 days. So please submit your answers. And well, before we transition to the next panel, and Sarah Leah, I will give you the answer or the the feeling of the audience of the nearly 200 of you that have joined us today. And just thanks again to Brittany, Sarah, and Rose for not only a fascinating conversation today, but for the work that you have done and will continue to do uh, in the next four years. Our work is not over. Um, we just have new opportunities and uh, abilities to, to make some much needed changes. So as we close here, we'll get the results and turn over to, here we go. So, um, oh, it's quite close actually. So pre-sale human rights conditions and vetting, I see Sarah clapping her hands, but also working with Congress to require affirmative congressional approval, I think will be something that we'll talk about with the members of Congress today. And certainly something that Joe Biden himself um, proposed in 1986. So hopefully that will be uh, something that we will see move forward. Thanks again to all of you, to our panelists, to our participants for joining us. And I welcome you to our second panel. I think we're having a technical issue with Sarah Lee Whitson. Um, this is Ra'ed Jafar. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we are trying to unmute and activate the video of Sarah Lee. I think we're figuring it out now. Uh, Sarah Lee, can you say a word? Yes. 
Hi there. Can okay, you we can hear you now. <laughs> okay. Can you see me? Yes, we can. All right, great. Sorry, not a beautiful view behind me, but the light is too strong on my desk, so I had to rejigger uh, the location. Dadia. Hi. Kifik Habibi. Alhamdulillah, Kifik. Oh, Mashil Hal, inshallah, Kushita, ma'am. Mashil Hal. Zift. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, Inigo, nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you too. Also, Radia, hello. Am I butchering Hi. your name? Yeah, Inigo as well. Inigo is good. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm just waiting for a cue on when we should start. It says we're live. Ah, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to our panel uh, on uh, at the Arms uh, uh, Transfer Forum. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to join you today. Uh, I am the Executive Director of Democracy for the Arab World Now. Um, and join today uh, with Radia Al Mutawakkil, who is a director of uh, the leading human rights organization in Yemen uh, and uh, really a group that has done some of the most important, widespread, and thorough work uh, on uh, the war in Yemen, uh, the bombardment of Yemen, the human rights impacts, the violations of the laws of war, uh, with an extensive staff uh, that has worked in unbelievably difficult conditions throughout the country to document uh, the most egregious uh, abuses, uh, violations of the laws of war. Uh, that's our new dog that just walked in. Um, Apparently, can open the door. Uh, and uh, we're also joined uh, by Inigio uh, Aridonda Vera, who is an investigative journalist uh, in Mexico who has uh, examined and investigated uh, where US arms uh, have ended up uh, in Mexico, uh, something I read about a little bit before the start of our panel today, to, to uh, uh, my surprise about the extent uh, and proliferation of US. Uh, arms and, and the manner in which uh, they reach both the government and non-state actors in the country. Uh, I'm going to close my door. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Um, the uh, purpose of our uh, panel today uh, is uh, for us to get a better sense and a better understanding as a U.S. audience um, responsible for the conduct of the U.S. government about what exactly uh, the impact is of American weapons that are proliferating around the world. I mean, uh, Mexico and Yemen are sadly only two places uh, where American weapons end up. And, and of course, the United States is, uh, I believe, the largest weapons exporter uh, in the entire world. Um, but a conversation uh, um, with our guests today will, I hope, give us a better understanding of the impact of these weapons, uh, and not only the direct physical impact, but how they are perceived, uh, how the United States is perceived uh, in their countries, uh, and what their own recommendations are uh, to the US government with respect uh, to these arm transfers, um, which uh, particularly in the course case of Yemen, which has received a great deal of uh, uh, attention, uh, uh, has just caused unbelievable devastation to ordinary people in the country. Um, let me start in the, the format of this panel, and I'm going to uh, keep time uh, to make sure we stay on track. Um, is uh, to ask some questions uh, of our uh, guests and, and invite them to share their expertise with us. Um, and uh, then open it up to a question and answers from the audience. And I hope technically that works. Uh, let me um, uh, start by just establishing the facts. Um, uh, first uh, talking about Yemen and then talking about Mexico um, because many may not actually be aware of um, the facts of uh, uh, US weapons uh, in each of these countries. Um, so Radia, uh, I wanna invite you uh, to start by telling us what is the role of US weapons in Yemen? Uh, how have they been used uh, in their country? Uh, and how are American weapons uh, uh, reaching uh, Yemen? 
Um, Yemen now is famous as the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. I don't know if, you, if everyone knows that it is a man-made crisis. There is a war in Yemen where all parties to the conflict are committing horrible violations. One party to the conflict is called the Saudi and Emirati led coalition. Um, and they are leading a military intervention in Yemen. Uh, those who are receiving I mean, Saudis and Emiratis are receiving uh, US weapons, uh, uh, receiving weapons from the US. So Yemen uh, actually, uh, even if there is a war, doesn't have to be the worst humanitarian crisis. It is the worst humanitarian crisis because of the huge lack of accountability. And one reason of this huge lack of accountability is arms trade and financial interest between some states like US, UK, France, and some parties to the conflict like uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. We in Muwatana, we document violations by all parties to the conflict. And we also doc document, part of it is the uh, attacks by the Saudi Emirati led coalition. We do an investigative research methodology. And whenever there is an airstrike that attacked civilians, we go to the field and we try to uh, among our research, we try to find remnants of weapons. Uh, and in few of the cases we, we documented, we, we succeed to find remnants of weapons uh, and we sent them to uh, arms experts. And um, in 25 cases, uh, we, we could find remnants of weapons. They were US made weapons. In these incidents, hundreds of civilians were killed and injured and many with the, uh, of them uh, are women and children. And uh, in most of the cases, there was no military target and uh, nothing has been done after that. No investigation, no compensation, no redress and nothing to the civilians. And the, still the arms trade are still going on. So the beside the very direct, I mean, impact of the US uh, weapons to civilians, because of these financial interests, uh, the war in Yemen, um, there was no real efforts to stop the war in Yemen. There was no real efforts to help to, uh, to hold uh, all parties to the conflict accountable. And stealing weapons is just like um, a green light for parties to the conflict to continue their violations. Well, why are American weapons, just to be crystal clear about this, um, being used in, in Yemen? They have been sold to Saudi Arabia and to the United Arab Emirates, and they have been used by them. And Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, they trust impunity more than anything else. And they trust their allies, which is Americans. So they just use them to attack. Uh, it's supposed to be a war against Houthis, uh, but the incidents we have documented, which is hundreds of incidents, uh, it was not Houthis, it was civilians. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. Congress has tried to block arms sales uh, to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia on at least two occasions, uh, and this was uh, uh, overturned uh, by President Trump, um, and the U.S. has tried to end its own participation in the war in Yemen. I think people are not really aware that the U.S. is not just supplying weapons, uh, to the Saudis and the Emiratis, but is actually, from a legal standpoint, a participant in the war in Yemen. Um, what have been your recommendations uh, to uh, the U.S. government regarding the provisions of weapons and the U.S. participation in the war in Yemen? Uh, first, they should stop selling weapons, and they have to start investigation uh, regarding the violations that have been committed using US weapons. And they should also uh, support all the attempts of uh, uh, the avenues of independent investigation that comes, for example, out of the Human Rights Council and uh, support the avenues of accountability in general. Uh, this when it comes to Yemen. And as you said, the Congress uh, did a lot of work in this uh, during uh, Trump administration. And it will, the coming period will say, if Biden administration is different or not. Uh, and uh, I mean, in the, 
in the elections, it was clear that Biden uh, support the idea of stop to stop the war in Yemen and stop supporting Saudis and, uh, and Emiratis, but we will see what's going to be happened in the coming days. And also the US, they didn't even ratify the ATT and Rome statues, statue. So this is the easiest thing to do. These, I mean, uh, uh, things should be ratified by the US. I see. Um, and uh, well, I guess you answered the question about, well, what do you expect the Biden administration to do? I mean, on the one hand, um, uh, President-elect Biden said uh, during one of the presidential debates um, that he would end arms sales uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, that he would sanction Mohammed bin Salman uh, for his role in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and, and other crimes. Um, but since then, um, some commentators have noted that the uh, Biden campaign's uh, language has been a lot more muted, uh, talking about uh, reviewing arms sales or conditioning arms sales, but nothing that matched the promise he made uh, during that presidential debate. Um, do, do you or do the people in Yemen have a sense whether uh, President-elect Biden is actually going to keep his promise uh, and end uh, arms sales to Saudi Arabia? Well, people, they hope, they hope that uh, President Biden and uh, uh, Democrats were honest. And it's not like they are sure, but they hope. And it's not, it's going to be a really big shame if things didn't change. Uh, so it will show if what happened in Yemen through these years was just like a Trump administration uh, or it is a U.S. administration. If Biden just continue what Trump has done, then it's not Trump administration. It is the U.S. administration. And it's going to be a shame because uh, Yemen was used a lot in the elections and Democrats used the Yemen a lot. To, uh, to advocate to stop the war and stop selling weapons. So I don't know to what extent they will be honest or not. I would be surprised if they are not honest. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that, that uh, we often hear, and I'm interested in, in your perspective on this, um, is, and, and we just saw that reflected in the earlier poll, um, that some people don't advocate for an outright end to arms sales. Uh, instead, they talk about things like conditioning arms sales, you know, that they should condition them on, uh, I don't know, fighting uh, the war in Yemen in a nicer way, in a way that doesn't violate the laws of war, um, or somehow using arms sales as a way to pressure Saudi Arabia uh, and, uh, Yemen, uh, and the UAE and its allies to uh, act in, in a less unlawful way in, in pursuing their war uh, in, in Yemen. Do you think that sort of conditionality uh, would have an impact uh, on uh, uh, what the Saudis and the uh, Emiratis and, and their coalition partners do in Yemen? Because of the continuous of selling weapons to Saudis and Emiratis, all of these things uh, didn't happen. So selling weapons to Saudis and Emiratis, it's not like only providing them with, with weapons. It is just like a green light for them to continue. It's just like to agree that uh, crimes are committed with, uh, uh, um, without any kind of accountability. When financial interest is part of the system, part of the deal, then it's, it's a lie that uh, they will be pushed to uh, uh, change their, I mean, way of the war in Yemen. If it, if it could be happened, it will happen since the beginning of the war. It's six years now. And it's not one airstrike or two or three where civilians were killed and injured, it's hundreds. And most, in most of the cases, we found the US weapons more than UK or Italian or France. It's just because Saudis and Emiratis, they, tr they trust um, the support from the US. And maybe they just, uh, they know that they will not be held accountable by them. So, uh, that I can't, as a Yemeni citizen, as a human rights defender, I cannot set the bar low. My work is to set the bar high. And I think that it's not even high to stop selling weapons at this moment. It's six years of uh, horrible war with horrible violations. It is at least that, that the least that can be done 
it stops selling weapons to Saudis and Emirates. It's a message. It's not only not giving them weapons, it's a message. So what do you think about the argument that the US will stop selling certain kinds of weapons to Saudi and the Emiratis, the ones that, uh, uh, for example, have been used before in uh, unlawful strikes, but other weapons, they would be okay. So some of the weapons would be conditioned uh, and even stopped maybe, but other weapons would persist. Do you think that kind of a partial approach uh, to uh, weapons transfers um, would be effective? There are uh, states who respect human rights. Uh, they just, uh, 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 they, they panned their, uh, I mean, arms trade to Saudis and Emiratis without going through all these details, just when it was approved by human rights uh, reports that Saudis and Emiratis committed horrible violation, violations and some of them can be war crimes. So it's a matter of uh, principle and ethical uh, step to do. So I think selling weapons, any kind of weapons to countries that committed horrible violations and these violations are committed in a, uh, are documented in a professional way. Um, and, it doesn't make that big difference. As I said, it's a political thing. It's not only a financial thing or the kind of weapons. It's a political message. Um, and then finally, what do you, well, not finally, uh, two questions after this, but what do you think about the uh, argument that, well, if the US doesn't sell them weapons, the Russians will, or the Chinese will, or the Czechs will, or somebody else will. And so it doesn't, you know, we shouldn't really stop selling weapons because we give up our influence and, and other people are gonna sell them the weapons anyway. Yeah, you know, I've heard this and it is a little bit weird that such argument is, is there at the first place. It's just like saying, uh, if I didn't kill these people, then another criminal will kill them. Uh, and I said it's not. So what if other states uh, so had sell weapons, but not the U.S.? I don't know what's the problem. But as I said, it's not the the it's not that Saudis and Emiratis doesn't already have enough weapons to destroy Yemen. They already have the weapons, and they can continue. It's not that they don't have the weapons. It's because they are still receiving weapons and still have these arms trade from the US. They still have the impunity and they still not, there is no uh, strong push for accountability. So I don't know, it's, 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 a, it's a little, I mean, it's a shame that such argument is there. And this week, uh, Secretary Pompeo, in his few remaining hours uh, as Secretary of State, announced that he's going to impose uh, sanctions uh, on Ansar Allah and designate them as terrorists. Um, how is that being received in Yemen? What do you think the impact will be? Well, actually, I want to ask uh, Pompeo and his uh, administration, what will the impact will be in Houthis? how Houthis are going to be held accountable by this designation, how this are going to help to end the war in Yemen. Uh, such political decision will just influence civilians, it will influence Yemenis in general, and it will help Houthis to work more in their propaganda that they are against the US. It might help Houthis, but it will uh, affect us negatively, I mean the Yemenis, we are stuck, I mean, among crazy armed groups and a very wild, I mean, uh, uh, neighbors and a very, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but a very dirty political, uh, international political, I mean, approaches. So uh, many human rights and especially humanitarian NGOs, they say this will affect the humanitarian aid access in Yemen in general, but it will influence the whole, I mean, the whole hope to have peace in Yemen. So I don't know how this designation is going to help. I mean, it's, I, I think it's the last gift from Trump administration to their allies, I mean, Saudis and Emiratis. But the problem 
if Biden stopped this, then it is something that is related only to Trump administration. If Biden didn't stop this, then I, as I said, it is a US administration, but they wanted to do it through Trump. We will see what's going to be happening. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. I, I want to turn now uh, to Inigo, and I'm so self-conscious about mispronouncing your name, so I'm okay. Don't worry. Over and over okay. again in advance, I'm mortified. Um, I want to ask you, first of all, to educate us, um, because, uh, you know, maybe it's just staring into my own fishbowl, but I have a sense that Americans are pretty aware that the U.S. is arming the main combatants uh, in Yemen and uh, causing, you know, unbelievable destruction of, of, uh, uh, country, of the country of Yemen. I think that most Americans have no clue uh, about US weapons transfers to the Mexican government uh, or how those weapons are used. Um, and you know, they might think that weapons are stolen, guns are stolen to gangsters. Um, but beyond that, I, I, my guess is that there's no awareness. Can you give us an understanding of the, the reality, the facts about U.S. arms transfers to Mexico, the volume, the scale, what kinds of weapons we're talking about? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I have been re making a research about how the guns uh, make to Mexico like in the past like uh, 15 months. And at the start, uh, I was like uh, looking under like this narrative about the illegal guns that came to, to Mexico, to the United States to Mexico. You know? and, and according to the official data in the past decade, uh, they estimate like 2.5 million arms uh, came to Mexico through the United States. Uh, but, but also, uh, and these guns uh, were almost like in 70% uh, go to the uh, organized crime. So uh, since the past like 15 years, also the military, the Mexican army has been uh, put it by the president in, in that moment, Felipe Calderón, in the street. So uh, since that moment on, uh, the violence and the homicides in Mexico has been rising. Just only in 20. 18, uh, the official figure revealed that uh, mortality rates from armed violence uh, reached 70 of the total homicides, uh, around 40,000 uh, deaths. So, and, and this has been like a really struggle in the past uh, years, uh, how much did this violence and how much of this violence come with, uh, with, with the guns. And in, in the context is like in Mexico, there is only one store that sells guns here. And this uh, one store that is from the Mexican army and those store is in uh, in front of the headquarters of the Mexican army in the Mexico City. Yep, and that's that's it. There are only like two thousand uh, licenses to to that is like uh, from one uh, one person only. So there are like only two plus uh, two thousand plus that can uh, wear uh, guns in Mexico. And the other uh, amount of guns that are in Mexico that are that are illegal. Uh, so. That's from, from one hand. So deepening the investigation that I, that I made is like, uh, we have like this world of illegal guns that come from United States to Mexico. And now the Mexican government is like really pushing forward to, to make a uh, like kind of a negotiation with the US Congress to make like a bigger and more uh, transparent uh, laws to, to regulate this from, to, keeping to, to happen in Mexico, like the, the, these legal guns. But also the other hand is uh, the Mexican army in 1995 have the, the approval from the Mexican uh, president in that time that they uh, could buy guns to another countries. And also they can resell these guns to the Mexican police, like uh, police states, police municipal or municipal police. Uh, so that's another thing in, in this uh, context of 2006, when this uh, uh, situation, when the Mexican army go to the streets and they have like a really uh, combat with with a narco or, or, or with uh, organized crime all over the, the Mexican country, uh, they make the Mexican police from the states and from the, the municipalities, they start to get in more and more and more arms. So that's the reason that the Mexican army start to, to, to get more and more arms from the United States. Uh, so they have like a millionaire contract with uh, United States, uh, some companies that made arms. 
and they have been uh, given to the Mexican authorities. And then the Mexican army just resell these guns to the Mexican police. And in this, in this time that I have been reporting like uh, relation to human rights, there's like a always implication of the, of the Mexican police in some of the states. I have been covering Coahuila, there's a, a northern and in the border with Texas and also Tamaulipas. And this in, in these those two states, uh, the police have like really uh, several uh, complaints about a, how they manage uh, to get operations and got to get uh, people behind behind bars or, or try to or just like misleading all the gu the guns that they have. Like uh, some of them, some of the police uh, had put like some arms in in the in some scenes like crime scenes that that they don't have like arms and they just try to. Uh, create like statistics like they are like really making good job so that's the two things that I have been uh, researching uh, how the Mexican army have resell these guns that they bought to the uh, US uh, companies and also in these in these uh, operations the US certificates put us as, as the end user the Mexican uh, army but they just resell these guns to the Mexican police just to follow up on that, are you suggesting that um, the Mexican army is reselling these weapons at a profit uh, for the Mexican army or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they resell these, these guns to the Mexican police, like in, in, in the 31 states. But at a profit? I, I should say so, yeah. And um, are these weapons that the police units could not buy directly? I, th I think that's the only one that could make these uh, buys is the Mexican army, like in law, like the president just, uh, they gave, gave them permission in 1995. I, I guess the, the, so the, the question I have is, is this a problem? I mean, why is this a problem? I think that the problem is like, uh, we really don't know how many guns those the police are buying to the, to the Mexican army and also, uh, this is not uh, transparent from the Mexican uh, government about these guns. And also we don't know who also are buying these guns to the Mexican army because uh, they have like this uh, kind of thing that's a, if a military and ex-military that is uh, in, in not in, in work right now and they bought a lot of guns. They, there is no one that could uh, establish a parameter of how many guns an ex-military from the Mexican uh, military could, could buy. And then there are like a, a few points that mislead and how are these uh, police uh, using the, the guns that come from the United States. Uh, a lot of cases have been pointed out in the past like uh, six years of how much the police had uh, committed a violation to the human rights uh, by uh, not using cor the correct way these guns. So if you were to make recommendations to the US government now that we have a new administration coming in, um, what would they be? I think, I think that it will be like, a, in one way, yes, they, they have to control uh, the legal, and, uh, legal weapons that come to, to the United States from Mexico. Uh, there's like a well known about how Texas and uh, California are like the two most states that, that came their guns to Mexico. And, Perhaps is in one way just try to stop that in a matter, but also like keep tracking to to the guns that they sell to the Mexican army. We don't know why are they uh, doing that, no? Because there's like uh, for one side like uh, the combat that they have with the crime, organized crime, but in the other hand, uh, we have been reporting for the past year a lot of uh, extra, extra, extra like a lot of assassinations from the Mexican army to civilians. So. Uh, that's another thing. Like, if I don't know how, if, if the like, if police states for one thing and the other for the military, if they like really know how to manage these these guns and uh, keep tracking of how these guns are being used in Mexico. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Your focus is overwhelmingly on the issue of transparency and end use monitoring. Um, quite different from the situation in Yemen. Um, in our remaining time, and uh, hopefully the uh, organizers will give me some guidance, uh, I wanted to open it up to questions from the audience, and I'm supposed to get some texts for those. 
to see what those questions might be. Uh, let me check. Um, so I, I'm good, just going to read off some of these questions. Uh, I think the one uh, for Radia would be, are Russian and Iranian weapons also a problem uh, in the Yemeni war? Well, actually, uh, Houthis, the Yemeni armed group, uh, who are uh, controlling 20% of Yemen, uh, they are backed by Iran. Uh, but to Yemen is surrounded. So if, if Iran can send weapons to Houthis, they will just do it. Uh, we, uh, it's very difficult to track this because it's not direct. Like the Saudis and Emirates, they are in a direct war, uh, involved in a direct war in Yemen, but Houthis are backed by Iran. And Yemen is surrounded, it's a siege by the, uh, by the coalition. So I don't know how they will just reach their weapons to uh, Houthis. Uh, but Iran is a problem also in Yemen. Um, one question, I think this is one I meant to ask is, what can university students do working to advocate for divestment from weapons manufacturers that has come up on a number of universities? Uh, do you think that would be a worthwhile effort? Uh, interestingly, uh, both Yemen and Mexico have had extremely active uh, and activist uh, university student bodies that have uh, been at the forefront of demanding political change in their countries. Um, what recommendations would you have uh, to American university students? You want to start, my colleague? Sure, I, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Radia, why don't you take it? Okay. Uh, so I, I was uh, glad that many universities actually, or students, have contacted uh, Muwatana and asked us to whether uh, do interviews or participate uh, in events uh, regarding Yemen and the violations in Yemen, the war in general, and I'm straight. And this is just show how, how to what extent civil society NGOs uh, in Yemen and, and around the war uh, has succeeded to turn the war in Yemen from forgotten to and to shed some light to, uh, on the war in Yemen. I think they can do a lot. And uh, in Yemen, especially in Yemen, every effort has an impact. So if the students in their own, uh, I mean, way and tools started to talk about Yemen, about the violations in Yemen, about the violations by all parties to the conflict, not only Saudis and Emirates, I mean, also Houthis and other armed groups and the Yemeni government, and to ask for accountability and to ask to stop the war and help everyone accountable, it will make difference. And to push their, I mean, uh, uh, on their government uh, to stop selling weapons or to push them to, to push more for accountability or to push for peace process, this, this will, will do a lot of difference. Sure, for sure it will. Uh, in our two remaining minutes, I guess, I would ask you to tell me what your impression is of the United States uh, image and reputation in each of your countries uh, tied to the weapons that are being transferred and used in your countries. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Sure. I was reading today one of the last incidents uh, that we have documented where the US weapons were used. And I mean, I would say an airstrike in Yemeni government raid that happened in 2020. Uh, and this airstrikes about 32 civilians were killed. And in this village, it was a residential area in a village. In this village, there was no schools, no health centers, no electricity. So I was thinking that Maybe the, the only uh, developed technology they have known in this uh, village is the American bombs. Yeah, and I, and I think that uh, the Mexican uh, people that are there think about like almost all of the guns that, are, that are, have been used in the past like 15 years, like by the Mexican army and also by the uh, crime, organized crime 
has been uh, all over from the United States. Like uh, that's like a, a really uh, thing thing that the guns are all from the United States, and that's it, like really easy to get one gun to go to enter to Mexico. So uh, I think that perhaps uh, we could try to to like yeah, you say, Sarah, I'm, I'm pushing the idea to be transparent about the idea of being tracked into these guns uh, in an illegal, on a legal way, and just to make clear and, and see how it goes. And, and perhaps like the Mexican Congress try to make uh, a better and pushing hard to the uh, US Congress and stipulate how we can manage to get this uh, gun control. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. That does leave us with a little bit of an optimistic uh, uh, message. Um, I think that uh, with that, I have to wrap up this uh, panel and thank you for your time and sharing your uh, expertise and your experience uh, about uh, the impact of US weapons in, in each of your countries. So Inigo and Radia, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, I've gotten the notification that uh, that we're live for our last panel. Um, and I wanna welcome uh, our guests and also to thank our audience for sticking around for what I think is the, the culminating event that uh, I'm extremely excited for. Uh, my name is Dan Mahanti. I'm the director of the US program for Center for Civilians in Conflict. Um, and I have to say, I'm very honored to be able to host this, uh, this last panel with two members of Congress. Uh, who need really no introduction, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce them anyway. Um, but I, before I do so, I just want to say uh, to them and to our audience, uh, you know, I just want to recognize for a moment that this has been, at least in my lifetime, one of the most shocking uh, and difficult times for the country. Uh, and as someone who grew up, like so many Americans, with tremendous respect for the institution of Congress, um, I want to add an additional, um, you know, note of gratitude to our two uh, guests for joining today and to thank you both uh, for being here, but also for uh, for serving the country. Um, and on a lighter note, I just want to add a personal request that if we're going to keep doing impeachments every year during the NFL playoffs, can we push it back a little bit so we have something to watch before baseball season? <laughs> I don't want to make light of a serious issue, but uh, um, did want to kind of uh, add a little note of humor though. Um, I want to note quickly before I introduce the two guests uh, to our audience uh, to go ahead and post questions uh, using the question and answer function on Zoom. Um, we're going to try to leave a little bit of time at the end for uh, for a couple of audience questions, but I know uh, we've got a lot to address, uh, so let's go ahead and, and kick it right off. First, uh, let me start by welcoming Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who represents uh, Minnesota's 5th District, uh, which of course includes the, uh, the city of Minneapolis. Um, her committee assignments include uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Budget Committee, uh, and pertinent to this discussion, last year uh, she introduced the Stop Arming Human Rights Abusers Act, uh, and has then and since then been a vocal advocate for making human rights uh, and atrocities prevention a much stronger feature of US arms sales uh, and foreign policy. Um, next, I'll introduce um, now a regular to the forum on the arms trade annual meeting um, from California's 33rd district, Congressman uh, Ted Liu. Uh, among his uh, committee assignments, uh, he serves on the House Judiciary Committee and House Foreign Affairs Committee. 
Uh, and also germane to the discussion in 2019, he introduced the Armed Sales Oversight Act, uh, and he's always been a strong champion of improving congressional oversight of arms sales, uh, especially those that result uh, are likely to result in civilian harm or human rights abuses. So welcome to you both. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Of course. Um, Ed. Let's Hi, Johan. Good to see you. <laughs> Great to see you too. Let's go ahead and kick things uh, right off. Now, we had structured a number of questions when we were planning this conference before last week, um, but because last week really is kind of the elephant in the room, um, it does offer us an opportunity to frame the discussion uh, perhaps at a, at a higher level of analysis. Um, and I think with the events of last week and, and even before that, a lot of us were wondering how to situate the importance of an issue like global arms sales or US arms sales around the world um, you know, amidst these larger questions facing the country right now, you know, questions of, of racial division and race, uh, questions of political and social fracturing, uh, questions of domestic and international accountability. So I'd like to pose the same question to both of you, um, you know, in terms of how you see the issue of global arms trade uh, and the United States' role in, as the unrivaled exporter of arms globally um, in light of what's happening in our country and how you, you connect this issue uh, or an issue like conventional arms sales uh, with some of the experiences that we're sharing here at home, uh, whether that's in Washington or at home in, in Minnesota or California. Um, we'll alternate answers to the question. So I'd like to invite Congresswoman Omar first and then we'll turn to Congressman Liu and then we'll, we'll switch the next question. Well, thank you so much for that question, Dan. Um, and again, really excited to share this, this virtual stage um, with, with Ted, who I enjoy serving on foreign affairs and just wanna thank him um, and my colleagues uh, who are helping lead the charge on, on impeachment and bringing about accountability. Uh, to your question, I do find it useful uh, to connect to them. I think one thing um, we have to be very careful about, especially as we respond to the attack on our democracy that happened last week is relying too much on militarization. One of the things we worked on last year doing the protest around George Floyd's murder in my district was eliminating the sales of Pentagon equipment to local police forces, for example, and of course, you know, we um, also sell those weapons to police forces around the world uh, with records of brutality. To name a couple of examples, we saw U.S. origin equipments being used in Nigeria against the NSARS protesters. Uh, and, you know, we, of course, have seen the devastation caused by U.S. security cooperation in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates especially in Yemen. So yes, um, this resonates at home and abroad and we have a responsibility um, to, uh, to respond to terrorism and to threats, uh, but we often do it um, in a highly militarized approach um, with very little regard to human rights. And as we move forward, from this really traumatic event um, that took place last Wednesday, we need to remind ourselves that this approach has not made us safer and um, has often meant going uh, against our values. Congressman Liu, do you wanna add your own thoughts here? Uh, so uh, thank you, Dan. Um, and want to say what a pleasure it is to uh, serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee with Congress woman, uh, Ilhan Omar. Uh, all of you should know she was uh, actually one of the first members of Congress to introduce articles of impeachment and she helped get the ball rolling. So thank you so much uh, for doing that. And in terms of uh, answering your question, I think one link is that this is about allowing a president to get out of control. And we saw, for example, with arms sales uh, that there were not a lot of constraints uh, on Donald Trump. And when Congress tried to constrain his arms sales to Saudi Arabia, uh, Secretary Pompeo came in and made up uh, a fake justification, a fake emergency, uh, then allow those arms sales to proceed. And every time Congress did not constrain Donald Trump, I think he felt more and more emboldened. And then for the last two months where we uh, did not push back hard enough on the big lie uh, that somehow this election was stolen, uh, it was not. It further emboldened him and he routed up his supporters. And then on January 6th, he incited a mob that violently attacked the Capitol, resulting in multiple deaths. 
so I think one central link is how do you constrain a president, uh, both now and in the future. And I think Congress just has to do a much better job in holding the executive branch uh, accountable. Well, that's actually kind of a perfect uh, lead in um, as we kind of leave the larger, some of the larger questions relating to kind of what happened last week and get more into the uh, the meat and potatoes of the conversation at hand here around around arms sales and arms transfers and security cooperation, um, which, as you both know, for a long time has been subject to, um, you know, some scrutiny, if not debate around sort of the, the respective roles that each the executive branch in, in Congress plays. Um, you know, and some of those issues were, were really brought to a head in the last four years with, you know, some of the, the cases that, that you mentioned specifically. Um, so, you know, the, the framing that we have now is that over the last couple of years, this, this particular administration, as you characterized it, Congressman Liu, um, seemed really committed to, you know, not only, you know, as you described it, sort of being, um, not submitting itself to constraints and, um, you know, restraint, but also, um, as a matter of policy, really opening the floodgates um, for arms deals. In fact, making it a, a really a matter of, of, of pride uh, with the business community and, and the national security community. Um, and a lot of the, the arms that went through those floodgates were, were those that were directed towards countries where they were used in the commission of, of serious crimes, human rights abuses, uh, violations of international humanitarian law, or just um, you know, devastating incidents of civilian harm. Um, with that said, and, and, and taking a cue from your last comment, I can also hear, you know, in, in conversations outside of um, both uh, the Capitol and, and, um, and the state and defense departments, a, a murmur of, of skepticism that, you know, the election of Joe Biden is necessarily going to usher in like a new era, um, that the Biden administration is going to see good reason to, you know, deviate from the status quo or, or subject itself even to uh, the over, additional oversight from a Democratic Congress, and, and likewise, that a Democratic Congress might not be, um, you know, too interested in, um, you know, pushing the, Bi the Biden administration beyond um, its set of sort of status quo anti preferences. So, you know, with that said, and, and just recognizing the political moment that we've got, um, and not wanting to put you in a difficult spot vis-a-vis um, -vis the administration, still, be curious to know what either one of you would like to hear or would expect to see. Um, from the administration on the issue of arms sales, uh, you know, in the first, um, you know, days or months of, of the administration. And this time we'll start with, uh, with Congressman Liu and then uh, we'll turn to Congresswoman Omar. Uh, so thank you, Dan, for your question. I think one change that's going to happen is the Biden administration will actually provide relevant witnesses uh, to congressional committees. Uh, for the last four years under Donald Trump, they pretty much had a blanket um, policy out there that allowed their uh, witnesses to ignore congressional subpoenas, request their information. Uh, they wouldn't provide witnesses to a lot of committees. I think that's going to change. And so we're going to have the relevant decision makers uh, come before the Foreign Affairs Committee and, and provide testimony. So I think that will be a, a good change. Second is I introduced last term, and we'll introduce again, the Armed Sales Oversight Act. So in the Senate, any senator uh, can actually uh, object to an arms sale and force a debate. Uh, I think the House should be able to have that happen too. Um, a lot of Americans just have no idea about how these arms sales are happening. And the fact that you're able to at least highlight the issue and force a debate uh, on this, I think would be helpful to bring this attention to the American public. Uh, one thing that uh, Congresswoman uh, Omar has been able to do uh, is to highlight issues and, and bring them to uh, the public's attention. And I think on this specific issue, we could have a procedure uh, that can uh, formalize it so that any member can then force a debate on any particular uh, arms uh, sale. I think that will be helpful just to at least get the American public to know that this is in fact happening and why it's happening. And uh, hopefully the uh, Democratic House and Senate will, will pass that and hopefully Biden will sign it. Congresswoman? Yeah, I, I associate um, myself with those comments. It, it certainly would be a, a, a very welcome change to, to certainly get testimony um, from uh, the you know members of uh, the executive committee to come and and respond to um, 
you know, our inquiries. Uh, but for me, uh, first and foremost, I would want to hear uh, the new administration say that they are re-examining the announced arms sales to the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Uh, we had, unfortunately, the joint resolution of disapproval of the Emirates uh, arms sales uh, fail in the Senate. Um, I led a House version of that. Um, resolution. Uh, I know uh, Congressman Ted Lieu uh, let his own joint resolution in 2019 for uh, other sales to Saudi Arabia and the Emirati government, which I supported. Uh, but the Biden administration is still, still has a chance to cancel those sales, uh, and I believe they should. Um, and they should also take immediate steps to remove the United States from supporting Saudi led coalition uh, in Yemen again. <laughs> I think that has been uh, made clear by members of um, the House uh, and the Senate has, um, Senate Democrats have continued to push for that as well. But I think you're right that this is a, a bigger problem just than just the armed cells to Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. Um, you know, we let a letter um, last year um, with again my colleague Congressman Ted Lieu, um, with you know 17 other colleagues, uh, asking for the government to um, consider uh, selling um, weapons to uh, countries with human rights concerns, like the Philippines, Egypt, um, India, and I think Hungary was one of the countries we've we included in that. I think for our own national security, um, we need to stop arming human rights abusers. Uh, this is, you know, something that we have to do as in a statement of um, values, which is why I introduced the Stop Arming Human Rights Abusers Act last Congress, and I plan on doing that again this year um, when we see terrible human rights atrocities um, are committed with made in the USA weapons. It makes us less safe. Uh, and it makes us less credible, uh, and it is um, something that continues um, to uh, really not speak to the values and principles um, we speak of on an international stage. Yeah, thanks for that. And in fact, it will it will surprise neither of you uh, if you weren't able to join the earlier sessions that the. Uh, the pending and notified uh, sales to both UAE and Saudi uh, were, were a topic of frequent uh, discussion uh, throughout the course of the day. Um, and you mentioned, uh, Congressman Liu, the, the legislation that you had introduced and, and, and Representative Omar, you had also uh, made reference to your own. And I just wanted to, to ask a question about that. You know, this is one of those issues that has not always received a lot of um, concentrated attention or focus from uh, the Congress absent some, you know, motivating crisis, for example, you know, Saudi Arabia, or the, sorry, I should say the Yemen uh, crisis. And, and part of that, I think, is because it can be either difficult procedurally, as your bill went to address uh, Congressman Liu, or because uh, representatives and, and senators tend to see uh, the issue of arms, arms sales as, um, you know, issues that they can't really touch because of domestic uh, constituent uh, concerns around, you know, the economy and, and jobs and so forth. And even so, we've seen, you know, just like your bills, we've seen other sources of, of legislative innovation. We saw, you know, a, a bill come out from uh, the Senate this last year. Um, we've seen a couple of uh, independent initiatives from people like Senator Patty Murray. Um, you know, is there a way that we can take advantage of some of the momentum to generate uh, a broader base of support within the Congress for um, the necessary reforms, whether those are procedural reforms, uh, such as, you know, you know, Im improving the House's ability to oversee arms sales, or if they're, um, you know, policy oriented uh, changes that, that call on the State Department or, or the Defense Department to do something differently. You know, what do we need to do to generate a broader base of support, both, you know, in a bipartisan way, but also bicamerally across the Congress? What are, what are you telling your colleagues uh, to get them motivated? Uh, what can we do from the outside? What do you, what do you think is needed and how can we get there? Who would you like to answer first, Dan? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I think we're back to uh, uh, Representative Omar first, and then we'll turn to Congressman Lou. Sorry. 
Um, I think we have seen uh, some, some cases, as you've alluded to, where um, Republicans have been on board uh, with some of these initiatives. I think, you know, arms sales and um, the military industrial complex, um, the forever wars, all of those conversations um, sort of are somehow mainstream and they're not. And, you know, we, we can do a, a, a better job at, you know, normalizing these conversations, drawing people into uh, these, these conversations. And I think that oftentimes as Ted was saying, you know, there, there aren't um, a lot of cases where the, the public is being made, awa made aware of these transactions. The public isn't being made aware of the uh, domestic and international um, impacts that, you know, these actions have um, on um, our national security, um, the amount of money uh, that that is going into uh, that's taxpayer dollars um, isn't really publicly um, uh, talked about, and I think you know we had we had an opportunity with some presidential candidates where you know that that was being normalized and having a conversation. But even if you think about you know the the general election debate, um, none of these were part of uh, the debate. It wasn't a, a topic. Um, and I think that there are met, you know, many opportunities and, and forums that could uh, be created in order for us to broaden, um, you know, who, who is uh, considered a, a consumer of this information um, in, in order for there to be uh, momentum build uh, for different members of Congress to carry on this issue. I think right now it's a, it's a niche. Uh, there are a few of us who care about it. There are a few of us who have taken it on. Um, either it is, you know, something that is personal to us or something that our constituencies care about, but it needs to be something that, um, you know, that, that becomes uh, part of the conversation like healthcare is or educational funding or, you know, any of the other things that we care about because it does have an impact on our economy. It does have an impact on our national uh, security does have uh, an impact on our standing um, in, in the world and it does have an impact on how we see ourselves as Americans. Thank you. Congressman? Yeah, so I agree with everything that uh, Congressman Omar said and I just wanna sort of maybe explain what it's like to be a member of Congress. Uh, so every year, Congressman Omar and I will vote hundreds of times. And on most of those votes, we don't get a single phone call, text, email, fax, anything. Um, and Congress is dealing with hundreds and hundreds of different issues. I can guarantee you arms sales is not in the top 10 of most members of Congress. They don't walk around thinking about arms sales. Uh, so when your organization and other organizations that co-host this event and are participating, when you go educate members of Congress or their staff, that's very helpful. Um, just simply bringing up these issues uh, and just letting members of Congress know, especially new incoming uh, freshman members of Congress uh, that yes, there are arms sales and Congress has a role in stopping them uh, if we so choose to, and this is how the process works. And I think there's just a lot of education that has to happen. Um, so anything any of you can do uh, to help with that would be uh, very useful. Um, and with sort of every um, passing year, we do see more and more evidence of how some of these arms heroes can go awry and then result in uh, unnecessary deaths. So just sort of educating members of Congress and their staffs is uh, extremely important. That actually is a, a fantastic, um, you know, both of your responses are fantastic and address some of the questions we're getting from the audience on steps that they can take. So very welcome uh, intervention. And I think, um, you know, both of your responses speak to this challenge that we have both within you know, the halls of government and outside of taking what has become a really technocratic or technical issue uh, and re restoring its proper place in, in the, the mainstream foreign policy and national security conversations. 
I would say as part of that, there we're inviting a different challenge, which is articulating why sensible controls and reasonable um, approaches to, to arms sales um, are a good thing, especially as the national security community kind of you know, gears itself up uh, for what it's describing as, uh, as kind of great power competition. And I wonder if either of you, again, wanted to take a step back and, uh, and offer thoughts on how uh, the U.S. can be, you know, a leader amidst its peers or amongst its peers, um, but nonetheless exercise, um, you know, appropriate constraint with arms sales and, and ways that we can, you know, again, um, help to articulate the value proposition as a matter of foreign policy and national security. And in this case, I don't actually have a preference of, of who goes first. I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on this on this issue. Welcome, welcome either of you to to provide some feedback. No, Han, you want to go first? <laughs> sure, I'll go first. I'll, I'll, I'll let you close on that. Um, I think, you know, first of all, as um, you know, the, the, these are great opportunities. We really do appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation and, and be included in, in this discussion. Um, as I said, I am planning on reintroducing the Stop Arming Human Rights Abusers Act. Uh, it's a bill that prevents arms sales, security aid, and security cooperations with any country that has been guilty of grave human rights violations. And I hope that you all will help us generate broader support for that. Um, I'm also very supportive of uh, Congressman Ted Lieu's uh, bill that helps give the House greater oversight over arms sales. Uh, and I hope that you all will help us generate support um, for his legislation so that we can see it pass. Uh, I think it is really a long fight uh, to make human rights central um, to arms sales policy uh, and, you know, with um, more uh, conversations like this and more awareness to the public. Um, there will be uh, success in, in us um, winning this, this fight. Uh, so Dan, when you mentioned uh, great power competition, it sort of brought to mind that uh, the point of arms sales is not to generate profit. Uh, that should not be the point. The point is to help the United States execute our foreign policy and achieve our strategic goals. Uh, so for example, we sell arms to Ukraine to help them push back against Russian aggression. And I think most members of Congress are generally sort of okay with that. Uh, but I think it'd be helpful, for example, for the Biden administration to sort of lay out, this is why we sell arms to certain countries and to have a strategy and a purpose and objective and a goal. Um, and if uh, the new administration would do that, I think it'd be very helpful to, uh, to members of Congress and to explain to the American public, well, why is it that we sell arms to various countries? And maybe when they look at it, they might think, huh, why are we selling arms to this particular country? And I think it's just helpful for their new administration to have a top-down review of our, of our arms sales policies and exactly what goals they're trying to achieve with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, you both for uh, for those responses. Sorry, I studied there for a minute because I couldn't tell if I was on mute or not. I think we've all shared that experience. <laughs> so luckily I'm not. Um, and something you just said, um, recalled another discussion that was taking place earlier in the in the conversation about some of the assumptions that go unquestioned when it comes to the value return on arms sales in service of foreign policy and national security goals. So I think your recommendation to do a review to assess kind of the assumptions and 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 some of the beliefs that um, that kind of persist uh, in upholding arms sales as kind of an unquestioned feature of foreign policy is is something that um, that has come up uh, in other ways. And as a part of that um, there's the conversation about what alternative means the U.S. might have to advance its security interests. And one of our audience members has posed the question of policy alternatives and whether or not policy alternatives should be and could be a part of the conversation around arms sales. Uh, and the question um, you know, is formulated around whether or not we could look at alternatives to militarize um, sort of approaches in arms sales uh, and look more at kind of conflict uh, you know, ways that the U.S. can can support, um, you know, address conflict in other ways, uh, perhaps for more of a human security oriented approach. And I didn't know if either of you wanted to offer any thoughts to the uh, the audience on on kind of policy alternatives uh, to the U.S. role in, in advancing global security. Um, so maybe I'll take this one first. So I personally think that uh, investing more in foreign aid would be very helpful. 
whether it's humanitarian assistance uh, or having uh, more Peace Corps volunteers uh, or having uh, USAID do more things in more countries. I actually think we get more return on those dollars, sort of building bridges uh, with other countries and helping other countries um, navigate through their you know, problems that they're having. Uh, so if we could do that, I think that would be a, a welcome change uh, with the new administration. It's actually an, an excellent point. And it, it reminded me that um, a year ago, maybe two, year, two years ago, right after I got elected, um, we. I was on a on a panel with um, on 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 a topic uh, like this, and there was a, there was a man in the audience, and he was I think like in 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 his sixties, and he said um, that he was in in the Peace Corps, and he remembers going back to one of the countries in Africa um, that he served in, and um, and he he was talking to someone of his generation. So someone, you know, that was like my dad's age. Uh, and he said, it's interesting because, you know, people of that age have an idea of America where their first interaction with the United States was with the Peace Corps. You know, these are people who are coming to um, to help and, uh, and, and, you know, the, there's a, there's a peace mission, um, and it is buying goodwill. And there is a whole generation, he was addressing me, he said, there's a whole generation of people that are Ilhan's age, um, who, you know, are from those parts of Africa where we, we are now seeing their first and only interaction with the United States is a, is someone in a military outfit. And so that changes, right, um, the, the way in which someone thinks about America's presence and the way somebody thinks about whether this is someone that is there to help you um, or harm you. And I think that in so many ways, we have an opportunity to change the minds um, and the hearts of, of the world uh, when we are engaging in, um, in spaces where there is aid uh, and there is support that is not um, through you know, um, avenues that can cause harm. Thanks to you both. I have to say, we don't traditionally get, you know, in excess of 100 people signing up for these these <laughs> these conferences. So your presence here has uh, has really drawn a lot of people in, and we're starting to see the floodgates open on on some questions. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll turn now to to a couple of audience questions and, and maybe try to um, merge them together to address some uh, some of the more um, consistent themes that we're seeing out there. Um, and one really deals with, um, again, kind of what the public uh, can, can do. And, and you mentioned, you know, making phone calls and, and really the importance of getting um, the public involved. Are there other ways that you would recommend to either your constituents or the constituents of other uh, members of Congress out there to get involved, either in their, their local districts or, or more generally speaking? And I know that uh, you would also refer to things that organizations like those participating in this call could do. But if either of you had thoughts, and I think it becomes less awkward if I just call on you one at a time, but uh, let's start with uh, with Representative Omar and then we'll go to Representative Liu on this one. Yeah, I mean, as, as Ted was saying earlier, I think it is uh, important for the, the public to, to recognize that, you know, hundreds of pieces of legislation are introduced every single month by members of Congress. Uh, and many of us might not even know about these pieces of legislation in order to even sign on to these pieces of legislation. Many of us are made aware um, that, that these even exist, that they need support by our constituents. So those phone calls to your member is important when you're when when you're when you're engaging them to say, did you know Congresswoman introduced a bill <laughs> in regards to this? Did you know you know Congressman Ted Lieu introduced a bill to this? Can you sign on? Can you support it? Because the more support there is for these pieces of legislation, the more we are able to have a debate um, in our committees uh, and possibly see the these policies. Um, you know, move forward. Uh, and I think 
that you know hosting local forums um, to generate uh, more interest locally is is a value. I do a lot of um, local conversations around um, the these policies. I know that a lot of members in Congress might not, um, but also urging your member of Congress to have these conversations, to host forums um, on on this. You know, to to again. Uh, make these issues as mainstream as is, you know, funding healthcare and education um, and forcing your members of Congress to recognize that they also have a role to play um, in, in advocating for a, a more just and peaceful world. Uh, so uh, I agree with everything that Congresswoman uh, Omar said, and just two additional thoughts. I think folks can look at uh, using social media. Uh, it's free. Uh, and in addition, um, if you sort of write a interesting post, um, maybe a member of Congress will see it, or maybe a voter in Ohio will see it, or someone in Florida, uh, you never know uh, how wide the reach could go. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Omar has a great uh, Twitter account. I, I want to let you know I have two. I have a very classy and polished office account, uh, and then there's mine. Uh, but what's sort of interesting is, um, you know, 20 years ago, let's say you wanted to say something to a member of Congress. It might, it wasn't that easy, right? You have to try to either get a meeting or sort of get through three layers of staff before you can talk to a member of Congress on the phone. Or, or try to catch them at a town hall. Now on you know, social media, sometimes um, I'll get into conversations with constituents or I'll see someone post a comment in response to a, 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 a post that I did. And so you can sort of have uh, an instantaneous direct line of communication to your member of Congress or to a Senator in a way that never would have been possible 20 years ago. So I think that that is sort of interesting. And, and I do learn uh, sometimes from sort of reading the various comments to my posts and sort of engaging some of these conversations. Um, so think about doing that. And then second is uh, letters to the editor. Think about writing one or two or three. Uh, you might not get published the first time, uh, but eventually you will, because even though it turns out a bunch of people write letters to the editor, it also turns out many of them are the same people. Uh, so when you start writing in and there are new voices coming in, at some point you will get published and then that's a way to also influence uh, people in a, in a different way. And I, I will say um, Congressman Lou does have a, a, a classic non-official Twitter as well. <laughs> I think a lot of people in our audience probably follow both of uh, your Twitter handles. I know I do. And I just remind the audience uh, and also your staffs that we're using hashtag responsible arms 2021, just a shameless plug for doing exactly what you <laughs> Uh, described. Um, I want to maybe, um, you know, add a, a kind of additional layer to this line of questioning that deals more with the political incentives and disincentives and in, in, in kind of more, um, I guess, uh, maybe cynical terms of cost benefit analysis conducted by members and some of whom have uh, industry in their own backyards um, and others that don't and, and really don't face those incentives, you know, absent the kinds of pressure you're describing. So, to, to kind of draw on a question that we got, uh, a couple of questions we got, including one from Mike Stone of Reuters. Um, you know, do we think that there will be a day or do you think even now uh, members of Congress really have to think about uh, electoral consequences when they're making uh, decisions or, or choosing whether or not to vote on uh, controversial uh, arms sales? Um, and then, you know, as an alternative kind of way of looking at the question, are there ways to maybe ease the political costs uh, for members of Congress who have uh, manufacturing bases in their bases or or um, companies in their own backyard who nonetheless want to um, sign up to support um, either restrictions or conditions or um, you know statements from Congress around controversial arms sales. So I uh, don't know if if either of you have thoughts on that. I, I'll turn to Congressman Lou to give him first uh, right of refusal, and then we'll go from there. Uh, I think so. The perceived political pressure on members of Congress to vote for arms sales because, you know, some defense companies might get mad at them is, is overblown. Um, first of all, most of these arms, it's, it's not, I mean, let's say it's anti-tank missiles. Well, most members of Congress probably don't actually have 
anti-tank missile manufacturers in their district. Um, I get maybe the one that has like the headquarters might want to vote for that or, or whatever, but most people don't really think about arms sales. The constituents that really talk about arms sales is just really not one of those issues that sort of rises to things that people think about. So I do think members of Congress can, can feel free to vote yes or no uh, on arms sales. And unfortunately, what happens is they don't get that vote at all. Uh, it just never makes it. To, there's no debate. It never makes it to the House floor. So that's why I introduced that legislation here. At least let's cause a debate. Let's at least get people to think about this. Um, because sort of the way it works is basically if the, you know, the Foreign Affairs Committee chair doesn't do anything, the arms sale just sort of goes through. Um, and so I think it'd be more helpful if we actually made members of Congress think about these issues and vote on them. Congresswoman Omar, do you have any additional um, thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do agree um, with with Ted on that. You know, it 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 it's it's something that's that stops the, the debate doesn't even exist, um, and so getting to vote on uh, some some of these policies uh, never really happens. Um, and I, I will say, I, I think oftentimes because we are living in um, an extremely glo uh, globalized world, uh, many of us also have constituency um, that might come from some of the countries where, um, uh, you know, the, the, the weapons are being sold to um, and countries where this, this debate um, involves. And so there might be pressure to support or not to support um, it, from, from some of these constituencies. I know that for me, interestingly, a lot of my pressure um, uh, comes from people who, who are upset about the fact that I am so vocal um, against you know um, the the Yemen war and uh, and against the Saudi-led coalition and against um, selling weapons to Saudi Arabia and and Egypt and and Emirates and other places. Um, now I don't care for that pressure, <laughs> um, and you know I I have um, reconciled the fears that that sort of come. Um, in, in regards to my safety and in, in, in being opposed to those. But I think for, for a lot of people, when there isn't a clear political incentive um, in, in these conversations, uh, they will not involve themselves. Why have the headache? Uh, if you know these policies are not going to move forward anyway, to insert yourself into this debate, um, knowing that there, there might be um, you know, hell to pay in, in, in a way. And, you know, some of us still do um, because we strongly believe uh, from a value um, state point, but, you know, to, to those who, who don't have values um, grounded in, in, in peace and in human rights, um, it is easy to just be a bystander to, to this conversation and not involve yourself. So we have to, create, I think, um, actual incentives for people to, to care about this. There has to be a political incentive, uh, and that can come from their constituents who, who do have um, values of, of wanting a more peaceful world. That's fascinating. And I think what's what's really compelling and interesting about both of your, your responses is it introduces this other question of, you know, is it better to... Um, well, I don't want to say better because you know nobody wants a situation in which we're having to consider arms sales to you know you know a situation in which there are a lot of civilian casualties or human rights abuses. But at the same time, that that helps to galvanize kind of cross the aisle pressure for doing something differently. And at the same time, those kinds of situations focus attention on specific companies, specific sales, and create those political disincentives. Whereas if you're taking a more generalized approach to more reasonable policy, whether that's procedural changes or otherwise. Um, you might lose that visceral appeal to doing something, but gain um, that kind of um, universal appeal. And I, I don't know if either of you have thoughts on like, what's the better approach? Is it to take advantage of, not in a cynical way, but to, to really push for change 
on the basis of real life situations where you can call attention to um, the consequences um, as a matter of strategy or um, is it more sensible to look for kind of uh, universal approaches that would capture the full range of these, uh, these issues as they come up? And I think we went to uh, Representative Omar first last time, so I'll turn to Representative Lou first. I think process can have a lot of effect on policy. And, uh, and again, uh, most of these arms sales get no debate. Members of Congress don't even know what's happening. It just sort of goes through. And I think if we can change the process to allow members of Congress to object and force a debate, that could alter policy. If the administration knew that they can't just sort of do these sales without much people paying attention, it might alter what they do in the future. And so I, I do think we should look at some procedural changes. And again, just have the administration come forward with uh, a strategy and articulate why they're selling various arms to various countries. Yeah, I mean, and, and, I, and I think, you know, having a conversation about the procedural stuff allows for people, um, especially our constituents, to fully understand and be educated about the limitations that we have um, as, as members of Congress. Um, oftentimes, people will think that there, that there is a role <laughs> for you in, in, a, in, um, in a decision where there is no role. Um, and you know that that sort of universal understanding of what what our role is um, in regards to making a decision on behalf of the country and what the role of the executive is in regards to making decisions on behalf of the country um, sometimes is not uh, fully understood by by everyone. Uh, just for example, you know you've you had uh, people thinking that the the vice president had actual powers. Um, to to change the results of an election, um, and you know, I I, I I might have only been in this country for twenty years, but for God's sake, I know this. You know, my uh, my grandfather who who spoke maybe I don't know twenty words of English knew this, uh, and um, you know, but 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 there are a lot of things that are not universally understood in 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 our country, um, and you know, the the pieces of legislation we introduce, um, even though they are slow to gain support, allow us to have a conversation in bringing people in to the fold uh, on how this is supposed to work, how it actually um, can change uh, and how the current policy that is in place um, and the restrictions uh, are creating um, a system that does not actually have the checks and balances that you normally think um, is associated uh, in, in these situations. You know, I'm old enough to remember when all vice presidents did was go to uh, funerals and <laughs> coronations. And when the most uh, controversial thing was when the vice president couldn't spell potato, but we're well past those days now. Um, so we, are, we are currently living in a, in a world where people think that the vice president is actually really powerful. So. <laughs> um, on this issue of process and going back to the earlier conversation about what the administration can do coming in, we've had some questions around you know, what a good partner to the Congress looks like uh, in the administration. And Congressman Liu, you had mentioned, you know, showing up, sending, you know, witnesses to uh, participate in hearings and to provide testimony. Um, the issue of transparency has come up a couple of times. Um, you know, starting with, uh, with Representative Omar, do you have thoughts on, on things, gestures, um, approaches that the new administration can take um, to really restoring proper checks and balances and to being a good partner on um, arms sales and issues of significant consequence like arms sales in the national security and foreign policy arena? Yeah, I mean, you know, as I said, um, alluded to earlier, not only did we not have a partnership with the administration as members of um, the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, there, there was an actual objection <laughs> to us fulfilling our duties um, as, as members of Congress and as members of, of that committee. Um, and, you know, our hope uh, is that th that that automatically changes, right, with, with the incoming administration uh, and that there'll be a posture um, of, of collaboration. Now, there is a lot to do 
um, in uh, cleaning up uh, the mess um, that was created in the last four years. Uh, I mean, I, I, I sat on the oversight subcommittee um, and, you know, we truly did not have the ability to do any sort of oversight. Um, and so now we have to retroactively <laughs> um, provide oversight of the things that have taken place in the last four years. Um, and, you, you know, the, the posture that we're looking for is that there will be collaboration um, because we're not only re-establishing trust uh, for members of, of Congress and members of, of the committee um, with the, the executive branch, we're also re-establishing trust with, you know, the, the international world. Uh, and um, secondly, it is going to be important for us to have uh, a full understanding um, of what the agenda is and how they plan on incorporating us um, in, into that agenda as we move forward in the next four years. Well, we've got time probably for about two more questions, maybe one shorter one and then, and then one to give you the opportunity to provide your, your last thoughts. But let me start with a little bit of a build off of that last question, which really deals with, that combines this issue of public support and participation in the process with uh, Congress's role uh, procedurally, and that deals with this issue of transparency. I, I can tell you, even as someone who follows these issues, it's not always easy to track what's happening with a particular sale, even once it's been notified to Congress, let alone ones that don't meet the threshold of, of being notified at all. Um, do either of you have thoughts or ideas or even plans of how that could change? Like how the first step in the public getting more involved is knowing what's happening, either on a specific sale or uh, procedurally. Um, do you have thoughts on, on transparency of process or specific uh, transactions? And maybe to uh, Representative Lou first on this one. You know, it was so interesting. Last term, Congresswoman Omar and I were actually at a uh, hearing where the issue was the Trump administration was um, basically uh, increasing um, sort of the amount of small arms they could sell without notifying Congress, essentially. And so we objected to that. And uh, hopefully, um, and, and taking other procedural shortcuts. So we're hopeful that the Biden administration would look at reversing that. Um, it's also very welcome news for all of us that the Biden administration uh, is much more supportive of alliances and working uh, with allies and uh, with other countries. Um, I mean, they're going to put us back in the Paris Climate Accords. They're going to put us back into the World Health Organization. Uh, they think um, building alliance is a good thing. And, and so when you do that, it does make it somewhat harder to then sell arms to a country that could freak out other members of the alliance. And so hopefully just being a much more integral part of the entire world community uh, instead of being sort of a lone actor would also sort of mitigate um, the administration just serves randomly selling arms sales to countries where we shouldn't be doing so. And I, I will, I mean, I, I associate myself with everything Ted just said, but you know, the one thing that I'm looking forward to the most is for us to no longer have a Trump fatigue. I mean, it, it, there is just so much that happens within a week um, that really for us, you know, as soon as we draft one letter to inquire about, you know, some some thing that they've acted on, um, there's five other things that come down the pipeline. Uh, and you know, if we we were having a hard time just keeping up, um, and you know, we we are going to have a normal president um, that goes through normal procedures and a normal timeline. Um, and hopefully that will allow for us to utilize our time more effectively and efficiently as we try to get, um, you know, the, these things to be more transparent for the public. Yeah, I've got so much to say about that, <laughs> that pace of events and policy by Twitter, which we'll leave for another day, but, um, but that's, that's incredibly insightful and helpful. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna leave you both with one last question. Um, and we believe in democracy in this country, but for a minute, I'm going to give you 
um, you know, kind of unfettered power in, in choosing what the Congress does on arms sales uh, in the next year and beyond. And maybe this is a conversation with, uh, with the speaker or another time when someone says, what is the single most effective and doable thing Congress uh, can do this year uh, to improve uh, the arms trade from its vantage point? I'll give you both an opportunity to answer. Um, I think I went to Representative Lou last time first, so I'll go to Representative Omar first and then to Congressman Lou for the last word. Pass our pieces of legislation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, one, you know, help uh, set red lines um, on, on arm cells. That's what my piece of legislation does. Uh, and, you know, uh, TED's uh, create, get, gives us the, the ability to have um, oversight and insert ourselves in that decision making. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't have a better uh, wish list than that. Uh, I, I agree completely with uh, Congressman Omar. Uh, the other thing I, I want to note is one of the things that happened this past these past four years is because there's so much crazy stuff coming out of the White House and out of Donald Trump. It was hard for uh, the press to talk about anything else, right? When the first seven things were so crazy, just report on them. But hopefully in Biden administration, that's not going to happen. We're going to, you know, if we go to the days of when the worst thing is if Joe Biden wears a pants suit, right? And that's the news. Then what's going to happen is that's going to allow press to focus on other issues. And if press could focus more on arms sales or talk about, hey, look, this is arms sales to this, this country and do an article on it. I think that would also be very helpful. And so I look forward to that when um, the reporting will no longer be you know, the next crazy thing the president did, but rather about all these other issues that are happening uh, in Congress in, in America. Yeah, hopefully governing by tweets ends. Well, well it's already, I, that, that has already ended, <laughs> so that's <was> good. <laughs> I, ha I just have to say uh, thanks on, on behalf of, uh, of our audience, but also the Forum on the Arms Trade and Civic, um, not only for participating today, uh, but you know, in spite, no matter what anybody's political views are, um, it's really wonderful to see you, know, you both uh, having led the charge to develop some affirmative options for the Congress on this, uh, you know, this issue of uh, incredible consequence for American national security and foreign policy and our role in the world. So thanks to you both. Um, and we hope to see you again uh, next year. Uh, Congresswoman Omar, uh, Representative Lou will tell you once you've done one, you're now uh, enlisted to come to all the other uh, sessions from here on out. But... It's a great club to be part of. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But thank you both. Thank you. Thank let, you. let me in closing, uh, let me briefly remind our audience um, that you can find the Forum on the Arms Trade uh, uh, at, its, uh, at its home uh, online at forumarmstrade.org, uh, where all the, uh, the events of today will be, uh, will be recorded and, and posted, I believe, also at the Stimson website and Civics website. Um, and I just want to briefly uh, just mention that this uh, event could not have come together without a, a small army of people working very hard to, to pull it together, especially virtually, which is tough. Um, the staff of both of our um, members of Congress here want to give a shout out to the schedulers and the, the press people and the, and the policy and legislative advisors in those offices, uh, especially uh, uh, Ryan and Corey, who've been outstanding to work with. Uh, and then with the security assistance monitor, want to give a shout out to Elias Youssef, um, uh, my colleague, Annie Scheel, who's just uh, um, amazing. Um, Ray Gerard from Dawn, uh, Jeff Abramson of the Arms Control Association and director of the forum, uh, and of course my brilliant uh, and co-moderator and host of the um, the event, uh, Rachel Stoll, and so many other uh, volunteers who, who came together. Uh, and then I also want to thank all of the other panelists who were able to join today for uh, for giving some of their time. But uh, with that, I will I will thank once again our, our two members of Congress for joining and and leave them to very busy uh, times over on the Hill and important issues. Uh, and once again, thank our entire audience for, for joining today. And we'll look forward to, uh, to being in touch. And again, uh, don't forget, hashtag Responsible Arms Trade uh, 2021 on Twitter. I'm at Dan Mahanti.